Robert Daly is director of the Wilson Center's Kissinger Institute on China and the United States. He joins us today to talk about, guess what, China. China, China. Yes, Once who knew? again. Who knew? Well, you, you know, something really interesting happening, though, I think, in this uh, aftermath of the, the Trump-Putin summit and all mm. this discussion. One of the things you keep hearing about Vladimir Putin's goal is to rebuild the bipolar world between Russia and the United States. And it has me thinking in anticipation of speaking with you. What does China think about this idea? China doesn't fear a Russo-American bipolar world. China likes the trend lines for a Sinocentric Asia. And if they see a bipolar world coming, and their preferred term, of course, is multipolarity, sure. they would see it as a Sino-US split, you know, Eastern and Western hemispheres. This is more uh, China's prescription. There is some, interestingly, in China, there's some worry that Trump wants to do a reverse Nixon. Just as Nixon played the China card against the Soviet Union, there's worry in Beijing that Trump's interest, professed interest in Putin, his warmth toward Russia, is about bringing the Rus Russians in on the American side of a bipolar world. I don't think this is where this is heading. It's, it's not in Russia's interest to do that. But China sees these dynamics you just described, obviously from a self-interested view, and worries more about this reverse Nixon. Do they, do they feel disrespected, or are they somewhat humored by this, this dalliance between Russia and the United States? Oh, well, I don't think they see it as a dalliance. I think they see many of the moves that the United States is currently making, and in particular, it's seeming withdrawal, withdrawal from constant interest in leading what we've come to call the liberal order. That is a gift to China. China has spoken for about seven or eight years now of what it calls its period of strategic opportunity, in which trend lines, economic, geostrategic, are in China's favor, and therefore it's identified a period, initially a quite discrete period, in which Chinese foreign policy, if wisely conducted, could be more effective. President Trump, Beijing sees as lengthening this period of strategic opportunity, which I think is why China has actually been very quiet about the Helsinki summit, it's been relatively quiet about the trade war. And you remember Napoleon saying, uh, don't interrupt your enemy when he's making a mistake. Mm -hmm. And I think that this is China's broad approach. Well, right al now. along with that, this sort of slow and steady wins the race uh, approach that we've seen now in agreements uh, with Israel for more investment. And trend lines would say that China will become the largest investor in Israel, surpassing the United States if the trend lines hold. Right. And then we see the discussions with the EU. Is this the big opening that President Xi has been waiting for? This is for? a major part of it. Uh, Xi Jinping, his China, is now looked to as more credible in some circles than the United States. And the EU shares the interests at the core of the Trump administration's economic approach to China. And it, we've confused, I think, ourselves, the Chinese, much of the rest of the world, about the goals of this protracted trade friction. But a percentage of the Trump administration's concerns are right on the money, are longstanding. I think that when Trump's uh, advisor, economic advisor, Peter Navarro, said, you know, China really started this trade war a long time ago. We're just catching up. I dislike the Marshall metaphor. But he's essentially correct. Europe shares those concerns. And yet, because it has also fallen within the sights of the Trump administration, it is now making common cause with Xi Jinping. We also just saw uh, the completion of an EU-Japanese agreement, which is going to lower tariffs. And so the rest of the world is playing a multilateral game. China wants to be seen as leading that very much in contradistinction to our unilateralism. That's part so, of its opportunity. Yes. So is, Ch is China the new leader of the, the free trade world? Certainly not. Uh, the Chinese economy remains closed. Uh, it remains predatory in some of its investments, and in other kinds of investments, it's providing more international public goods. But it is a highly self-interested power, which is trying to guarantee its own supply of goods, of natural resources, of energy, of food, and is in no way ready to make sacrifices of its own interests for the interests of a global system, which is something that the United States has not consistently done, but has regularly done. Is it then, is it then clear what they aspire to ultimately? Well, yes, they have said that they want comprehensive national power. This is their way of talking about having the kind of status, the kind of sway that the United States has had. It's economic, it's geostrategic, it's military, it's normative, it's cultural, it's a respect and a strategic primacy 
that has to be acknowledged even if things don't always go China's way. This is chi what's in China's interest, and their foreign policy now is aimed at creating a world that is highly integrated, they're sincere about that in many regards, and wholly accepting of Chinese practices and prerogatives. They want that kind of respect, that kind of influence. There's, a, there's sort of in the background, though, this contradiction that you described as a semi-closed system, if not right. a closed system. Is, is that goal attainable as long as the system remains as it is? Well, our theory has always been that it is not. And we've had uh, a number of theories about China's development since we started relations with them in 1979, even before that. One of the main theories was that as China got wealthier and as China became a middle-class consumer society, Chinese consumers would naturally become advocates for democracy. China has had a different theory of the case. Their theory has been that Chinese, humankind, are really sort of homo economicus. And as long as their economic, material, technological needs are met, and as long as they get better education and health outcomes, they will in fact be satisfied and will not challenge the authoritarian one-party rule of the Communist Party. These are two different theories, both seemingly plausible, much of the evidence before China's rise indicated that the American and Western theory was correct, that people who become wealthy consumers want to also make choices about their leadership. So far, China's experience has been that there may be another point of view and our theory might not apply. On, on back to the, the particulars of the so-called trade war mm. or the potential trade war, uh, some comments from Larry Kudlow this week that were not received well in, in China. Uh, it, rhetorical escalation, perhaps, but what about actual escalation? So uh, there has not been real escalation since we imposed uh, tariffs on 34 billion worth of Chinese goods. They then imposed uh, tariffs on 34 billion dollars worth of U.S. goods. We know what the next steps might look like if the countries can't find an off-ramp. And right now they don't even seem to be working on it. There are no discussions. There's an additional tranche of 16 billion that we are uh, ready to impose after a period of comment on Chinese imports, which would bring it to 50 billion. And the Trump administration has said that if Beijing doesn't back down, give satisfaction, and, and if it continues to impose tariffs, we go to 200 billion and then an additional 200 billion. In other words, we would put tariffs on everything that China uh, exports to the United States. So that is the setup right now. There is not an off-ramp. Both countries seem to think that they have the upper hand and they haven't felt sufficient pain yet uh, to back down. And so we speak of a trade war. We use this Marshall metaphor. But what it has really meant is that the prices of a small percentage of some of the stuff that we sell to each other have gone up for a period of time. And when you put it like that, it doesn't seem quite so dire. Well, you know, you know about that, uh, I heard one economist describe it as a slow-moving train wreck and that uh, it hasn't, the worst hasn't begun to manifest yet, but it's coming. Right. But the slow-moving metaphor also suggests there's time to stop the train before it goes completely off the tracks. Well, the And so the question sort of is, what, what's the nature of the, the train wreck? What is it that we're talking about? We're not just talking about trade and investment and economic relations. We're also talking about a long-term global structural competition between the United States and China as rivals, of which economics is a piece. And this is why you hear different kinds of messages coming out of the Trump administration. Sometimes they speak narrowly, as though it's just about the trade deficit. Sometimes it's about investment, terms of investment and reciprocity. Often it's about technology and about the importance of innovation to the United States' future as well as that of China. And the uh, Trump administration is focused on something called China 2025, which is a not very carefully defined Xi Jinping program under which China is to control 70% of the world market in most of the major emergent technologies and wants to do so through means that in some cases violate China's WTO agreements and in some cases uh, violate established practices of fair trade. The Trump administration though, when it speaks of China 2025, confuses its terms. Sometimes it speaks as though the problem is the methods China wants to use, but often it kind of gives the game away and says that the problem is China's ambitions themselves. Mm. The ambition to take the United States place as the leader in technology, from which increasingly military power, soft power, economic power flow. So when the Chinese hear this, well, let's say this isn't about fair terms of trade. This is about the United States' desire to maintain its hegemony even as it declines and to hold China down. 
it shouldn't be just about that, but we do give them rhetorical fuel for that fire, it then makes it easier for China's leaders to convince the people of China to endure some pain, and let's have it out now if we have to have it out now. Earlier you said that the, the Trump administration is essentially right about a lot of things. Yes. And, and, uh, but its critics would say that, but they're focused on the wrong things and that there should be a more laser-like focus on things like intellectual property. Right. What, what are the most acute areas that are in need of, uh, of addressing? Intellectual property is certainly one of them, uh, both intellectual property theft and also what's called coerced technology transfer. This is a bit of a tricky area. Uh, China denies doing it, but it has been doing it for decades. There's a question about whether or not it is government directed. It's certainly government directed. And the way it works is when an American company like Boeing, for example, mm -hmm. wants to go into the Chinese market and sell to China or manufacture in China, the Chinese side, the Chinese ministries will say, well, yes, that's very nice, but you can't possibly understand the Chinese market. You need a partner. Here's your partner. You must now give your intellectual property to the partner, which eventually becomes your competitor and forces you out. And this happens across industries. That's coerced technology transfer. The difficulty for the American government on this is that the American corporations have taken that deal. They've been willing to do that as the so price no of entry. no motivation for China to change. There's yeah. no motivation for China to change, and it's very hard for us to say, uh, this is unjust, this is tricky, when it's been done largely in the light of day with the cooperation of American corporations. And then there's the question of uh, reciprocal investment access. China is free to take advantage of openness and conditions here that it doesn't grant to us there. Mm -hmm. And in fact, as a cultural matter, Chinese and Americans do not have dissimilar ideas about what's fair. The Chinese know this isn't fair. They know what they've been taking advantage of. So reciprocity, terms of investment, relative openness, and intellectual property, these are the proper focuses for this. So, so Robert, what is your sense before we close uh, on when these issues will come back to the forefront and both countries will get back to the bargaining table? Well, I, I think that there's going to have to be another tranche, probably if we impose the additional 16 billion and China imposes 16 billion. And then we're going to see how much, have to see how much pain they're willing to absorb. But even if there's a short-term deal, because these economic frictions are just one subset of this long-term rivalry between the United States and China, which is comprehensive, it's not going to be over. This is a feature of the relationship. The Trump administration and its national security strategy called China a rival. At first, I didn't like that word. I was looking, is it antagonism? Is this a contentious relationship? What, what's a better word than rival? So I went into the dictionary and started looking up what these words meant. Actually, rival's the right word. Because if somebody's your rival, you don't have antagonism to, that, to the rival in the first instance. It's that the two of you are competing for the same thing. Mm -hmm. And that's right in the case of China. Both countries would like primacy. They're not antagonistic toward each other in the first instance. They have similar ambitions, and that brings them head to head, if not to daggers drawn. Well, we're told in, the, in an economic environment that competition can be a healthy thing, so I guess we're about to find out. Here's hoping. <laughs> Thank you, Robert. Thank you. Always enjoy it. Yep.